bursting, wriggling, engorged. These are some of the words that you might use to describe a praying mantis infected with a nematomorph parasite, also commonly called a horsehair worm. But beyond being a large and creepy parasite of insects, what if I told you that the horsehair worm, or Gordian worms, are also important aspects of the ecosystem that can substantially impact the food resources in their habitats? Well, in this video we're going to be talking about this parasite, touching on its biology, its life cycle, how they do and what they do, and then at the end we're going to talk a little bit about the ecology and some of the crazy conspiracies surrounding this particular parasite. But before we start talking about that, if you like this video or like hearing about parasites in general, make sure to like and subscribe as it really helps this channel grow, not unlike the parasite we're going to be talking about today. So like all my videos, let's start off by describing a little bit about the life cycle. And fortunately, this one is fairly simple compared to my previous video on parasites that make frogs grow extra legs, which you can see linked down below if you're interested in watching. Now, generally, horsehair worms have a simple life cycle, with most only requiring a single host. But oftentimes, this life cycle will incorporate extra hosts. With that in mind, let's start running through this life cycle, starting with the stage most people are familiar with, a massive worm crawling out of the butt of a praying mantis or a cricket. Well, this is actually the end of the life cycle, as what you're seeing here is an adult worm that has reached maturity and is now leaving its host. And while most of these worms are going to be between 20 and 40 centimeters long, some species miraculously can reach sizes of 2 meters in length, which is pretty freaking huge to fit into a cricket. As I just mentioned, these worms that are willingly leaving their host are actually the mature worms that are leaving into some kind of water typically, often in puddles, rivers, and even water bowls. Oftentimes they will appear relatively rapidly, and this tendency to appear in water bowls or water troughs actually led to the old time belief that they were actually a horse's hair that had fallen into the water and spontaneously came to life. Obviously now we know these aren't in fact horses' hairs that have spontaneously come to life, but are instead parasites emerging from their infected hosts, and they're looking to mate and then lay eggs. Now, these eggs are always found in the water, hence why the parasite likes to emerge from its host into the water, but in the water they can lay their eggs on a variety of substrates such as leaves, sediments, and twigs. And if you're looking in the right location, this shouldn't be too hard to find the eggs, because females will lay up to 8 million eggs in a span of 2-8 to eight weeks. After being laid, the eggs will stay attached to these substrates for a few weeks after which they will hatch, and then from there there's a few different paths that are available for the parasite to get back to its host. The first pathway is the most obvious and it's the simplest. The parasite is directly drinking by its host. So that would be a cricket or a prey mantis drinking water that has the larvae of this parasite in it. After which the parasite will get into the hemocyl of the insect, which is just a fancy word for the primary body cavity containing the circulatory fluid in an insect. And here the parasite will start to absorb nutrients from the insect host, and then it will go on to repeat its life cycle, so growing to its mature size and then leaving out the butt of the cricket. The second possible method is slightly more complex but still quite simple overall. See, the parasite larvae, instead of being directly taken up into the insect, will actually insist into some type of plant material such as leaves, grass, or something growing in the water. And from there, it will just wait until cricket or something else comes by and eats it, allowing it to get back into its cricket host. Now, the last, and in my opinion, the most interesting way this parasite has evolved to get back to its primary host is the incorporation of a peritonic host. Now, let me define what a peritonic host is. A peritonic host is a host that the parasite lives in, but it doesn't grow in. So it sort of acts like a taxi for the parasite to get from one host to the next. This may sound similar to a second intermediate host, however the difference between a peritonic host and an intermediate host is a peritonic host is optional. It's not required for the parasite to go through this host to complete its life cycle, so in this way it differentiates itself from an intermediate host which is always required to complete the life cycle. So knowing that, we can now describe how this parasite actually uses the peritonic host in its life cycle. So the common peritonic host species in this are insects that have aquatic larval stages, such as mayflies, caddisflies, and mosquitoes. And these insect larvae, they will unintentionally eat the baby parasites. Now something all these peritonic hosts have in common is that their larval stages are aquatic, but their adult stages are terrestrial. So when these insects go through metamorphosis and then leave the water, they also take the parasite along with it. And what this parasite is counting on is for some type of larger insect such as a praying mantis, a cricket, a spider, a cockroach, plenty of different insects. Here, back in its adult host, the parasite will go back to the hemocell and it will start to siphon off the nutrients from this new host. And this can take about 2-8 to eight months depending on different variables such as environment and the specific species. And then once it does this, the parasite wants to get back to the water. But here's the thing, many insects actually don't drink that much water. 
In fact, they typically get their water from drinking dew in the morning or eating other insects that have high water content. And even less frequently than that, do insects submerge their asses in water. So this brings the question, how does this parasite actually get back to water if its host doesn't really encounter water all that frequently? Well simple, the parasite simply manipulates its host and encourages it to jump in water so it can leave. Now observations of this type of behavioral manipulation date back to quite some while ago, with the first published observation that I could find being published in 1885 by Dr. McCook who wrote, the fact that the crickets had evidently learned that the parasite infested them required the water in order to make its egress and had deliberately sought the suitable place and assumed the proper position necessary to ensure that egress. This is one of the earlier descriptions of this manipulative behavior, but since there, there have been numerous other studies detailing more quantitative findings. For example, one study in France found that when placed near a swimming pool, approximately 2 meters, Infected grasshoppers were over three times more likely to jump into the swimming pool as compared to non-infected controls in a 15-minute period. Further, this was followed by a laboratory experiment where they observed that when encountering water, infected crickets were more likely to enter it compared to the uninfected crickets. Beyond these behavioral experiments, other studies around the same time have looked at protein differences in infected and non-infected grasshoppers to try to find the mechanism to explain these observations. And what they found was that infected grasshoppers had certain effective molecules that they believed influenced the grasshopper's central nervous system. Specifically, these proteins were similar to those known to influence other insects, though at the time of the publication, protein databases were much less developed than they are currently, so more specific answers were not available. But aligning with these results, another study observed that the manipulative process in infected crickets correlated with variations in concentrations of amino acids, and that infected cricket brains were undergoing much more rapid cell growth compared to healthy crickets, which could also be a sign of impacted behavior. Regardless of the details of how this manipulation takes place, most of the literature seemingly agrees that this parasite exerts some sort of manipulation, and this process seems to have a strong influence on the ecosystem as a whole. The reason I say this is because researchers in Japan found that the tendency of infected crickets to jump into water bodies can increase the energy inputs into aquatic ecosystems, with their estimates suggesting that these parasite-derived interactions could account for 60% of the annual energy intake of Japanese trout. Now this doesn't account for the other fish species that may also be benefiting from this parasite, and there likely are downstream effects on birds and mammals that feed upon this fish in the ecosystem, making this parasite important for the ecosystem function as a whole, as it's an important energy movement source. Now occasionally these parasites are liberated from their host before encountering a water source. Oftentimes this is the result of someone stepping on an infected insect, or from an animal trying to eat the host before the worm is ready to leave. Under these circumstances, some authors report that these worms may actually engage in anti-predator avoidance behavior by preemptively emerging from a host that is caught by a predator. This point was exemplified by an unusual mortality event in a bird in which the skeleton of a tomtit bird, a small common bird found in New Zealand, was found hanging in a tree with what appeared to be a horsehair worm wrapped around its leg. It was assumed that the worm had escaped from its host while the bird was eating it, then it tied itself to the bird and around the branch, ultimately dooming the poor creature. But outside of this very rare and unusual example, these worms are completely harmless to vertebrates like you and I. That being said, there are a few crazy conspiracy online surrounding these worms. There are unfortunately some health influencers that push the myth that these are actually a human parasite. Oh my god! That is a horsehair worm. And yes, humans can have horsehair worms. See, it's not a hair. They live in the kidneys, cause you to have back pain, and they come out of your urine. Everyone should clean! That the government is hiding or some other conspiracies in that vein. These claims are all complete pseudoscience, and the people making them up are near exclusively trying to sell some kind of bullshit cleanser or some kind of detox, which is always a scam. That being said, these conspiracies, like most conspiracies, do originate from some kernel of truth that has just been grossly distorted. In this case, there was a study in which two people in Japan each vomited up an adult horsehair worm, with the ultimate conclusion being that these people most likely ate an insect that was infected by the horsehair worm that then was released in their gut. There have been a few other similar reports in the literature as well, all drawing the same general conclusion of incidental insect consumption now, despite these studies coming to quite concise conclusions saying that these people aren't actually infected with the parasites, I've unfortunately seen this type of pseudoscience pushed online in several different forums, so I just really wanted to address it as I really can't stand this type of pseudoscience conspiracy bullcrap. 
So I hope you liked the video and found it informative, interesting, and entertaining. Uh, I think this is a really cool parasite that you can find pretty easily depending on the time of year and where you live, so that makes it a really cool one to talk about, and it is pretty wicked to see how big it is. Uh, going forward, I'm going to be doing a few more videos focusing a lot about these crazy parasite conspiracies and some of these scams that are really prevalent in the field. So if you want to see more about that or you have any specific cleanser scams you want me to address, please let me know in the comments because I really would love to field some ideas from the community. And in the next coming video, you should expect to hear about RFK's brain worm as I start talking about the biology of the one that is supposedly infecting him. So thank you.